Welcome, everybody. I'm your host. Oh, we're not starting. Just testing the mic. Testing, testing, testing. Sorry about the confusion. No, every it's a, testing the mic, testing to see if it's going through to the online audience. Testing, testing, testing. Testing for my supervisor, Rich. Yep, words, words, words. I am Drew. Welcome to the program. Not starting quite yet. Testing my mic, making sure that the sound is coming through clearly. Uh, Stephanie, can you say a few words for Rich, please? Yes. Can you hear me? So, sound, sound I can. Okay? Yeah. Sounds good to me. Okay, great. I think yeah, I think it might be need to be a little louder. He's coming to turn it up. Thank you. Can you ever say a few more words, please? A few more words, please, Stephanie. Sure. Sounding better now? Yep. Great. Oh yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Just um yeah, keep your hand there because I think when you start putting your hand over this thing. That's when I started hearing some clicking. Oh, no problem. Technically, that should matter, but. Yeah. 
She's just going to be on the screen from Zoom. So now they can't hear me, right? Okay. All right. So I'm just talking with you, and I see, you know. Wait, say that again. Oh. Uh -oh. You're on, that. Julie. I don't it's see oh, there's a mute button. Okay, I see it. Thanks for being part of this experiment. Uh, 
Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for being here. We're so glad that you're here. Um, I'm your host, Drew the Dragon Slayer Thomas, coming to you live, both online and in person from the Norman Rockwell Museum. The mission of the museum is to illuminate the power of American illustration art to reflect and shape society and to advance the enduring values of kindness, respect, and social equity that's portrayed in Norman Rockwell's art. I'll begin by reading the land acknowledgement. It is with great gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we're learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land on which the museum was built. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So now I'd like to welcome you all to our Tuesday program, Meet the Artist series, where as Mary said, this is our seventh episode, where we'll be talking to some of the most talented painters and illustrators of our generation, as well as you all, as well as everyone here in the audience, both online and in person, who we encourage to be a part of the conversation as well. Today, we are thrilled to be talking with Julie Bell, Julie will speak about her creative life, including her early work and inspirations, connections to bodybuilding, her process, and more. We're grouping the questions uh, by theme, so we invite you all to ask relevant questions as she shares about each topic, and at the end, we'll open the floor for additional topics. Now I'd like to introduce Stephanie Habush Plunkett, the Deputy Director and Chief Curator of the NRM uh, Museum. Welcome, Stephanie. Oh, thank you very much, Drew, and welcome, Julie. We are so honored to have you here, and we're all huge fans of your work. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank Great. you, Julie. Um, I'm going to just provide a little background on, on Julie's incredible career, and then, of course, you'll be learning a great deal more as we go through her slides. But Julie is one of today's most in-demand fantasy artists. Uh, she studied art in college and worked briefly in children's book illustration, uh, actually a field that she's returning to, and she'll say more about that. But while raising two young boys throughout the 1980s, she achieved great success in professional bodybuilding. In 1989, she was introduced to legendary illustrator Boris Vallejo, and she began modeling for him. Julie became inspired in return uh, to return to illustration. And in 1992, one of her paintings appeared on the cover of Heavy Metal Magazine. Since then, she's created advertisements for corporations, designed video game packaging art, and found work in the comic book industry, where she became the first woman to illustrate Conan the Barbarian for Marvel Comics, a very big deal. Julie and Boris married in 1994, and they continued to inspire each other, occasionally collaborating on paintings. Julie's work has been the focus of books such as Hard Curves, The Fantasy Art of Julie Bell, Soft as Steel, The Art of Julie Bell, Titans, The Heroic Visions of Boris Vallejo and Julie Bell, the Fabulous Woman, Women of Boris Vallejo and Julie Bell, and Dreamland, The Fantastic Worlds of Boris Vallejo and Julie Bell. In addition, Julie and Boris publish an annual calendar featuring their work. In 2009, Julie received the Chesley Award for Lifetime Achievement. And in 2013, the Art Renewal Center awarded Julie the title of Living Master which uh, as they have described, means that Julie has mastered all of the building blocks of great art, creating fully professional works of art as well as some identifiable masterpieces. She has successfully created a body of work which demonstrates accomplished facility in her craft that compares to the masters of prior centuries. Her work demonstrates strong, reliable poetic sensibilities which intertwine great universal subjects, powerful original compositions and mastery over all aspects of the craft, working seamlessly to enhance the chosen subject. And of course, those of you who know her work um, know that this is certainly true. Within the Enchanted exhibition, 
uh, here at the Norman Rockwell Museum, which we hope you'll be able to visit. We are proud to feature artworks by Julie Bell, Boris Vallejo, and Julie's two sons, Anthony and David Palumbo. Her painting Pegasus Befriends the Muses is truly a showstopper. And um, I'm also really happy to report that the exhibition will travel after it closes here uh, on October 31st to two other museum venues, including the Hunter Museum of American Art in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the Flint Museum in Michigan. And we're so happy to have you all with us tonight and um, really looking forward to hearing more about Julie's art. So with that, maybe it's just a, a good way to start out by asking you how you got involved in fantasy illustration. Well, first I just wanna thank you for that really nice introduction. That was lovely, <laughs> it's really beautiful. Well deserved, my goodness. And, and I'm really excited to be part of this exhibition and uh, doing this webinar as well. Um, but how I got started in fantasy illustration, uh, I think I um, was always drawn to it even before I realized that's actually what it was. Um, when I was younger, I really loved all the Art Nouveau images and the old illustrations from, um, you know, like the age of like N.C. Wyeth and um, Kay Nielsen and Duloc. And um, I, and those are totally, that, that's the fantasy that we all, you know, dream of when, when we, I think most fantasy artists have been inspired by artists from that particular period. Um, but anyway, uh, so I, I just always loved that kind of look, you know, with the, the designs and everything. And um, I, as you mentioned, I was involved in bodybuilding and I, um, you know, have always loved the, seeing the human uh, body, you know, being really beautiful and everything. And, and I think that, um, you know, fantasy art really works well with this kind of thing because it's all about these larger than life you know, heroic figures and self-empowerment and, you know, fantasy art is, you know, even going way back hundreds of years, the art, you know, would show people being powerful, men and women. And um, so I think it's just a feeling, you know, how fantasy art works with this realism, but at the same time, it's with all this kind of elements that really attracted me. Um, and then when I met Boris, of course, um, you know, that's what he did. And it just was so weirdly like meant to be <laughs> because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it just, then it was like, oh, here's, here's a way to, you know, be ushered into this world that is, you know, just really direct. So it was just kind of an amazing thing to happen. These photographs are absolutely amazing. Um, how did you um, get involved in bodybuilding and, and how long did you train? Was that a long career? I was competing for five years. By the way, I need to correct one thing that you said in the introduction. You mentioned that I was a professional bodybuilder and there's a distinction between professional and amateur and I was Thank not you. professional. I was a, a nationally ranked amateur bodybuilder. I had oh, been wow. in national level competitions um, you know, but uh, not at the professional level where there was money, money prizes were involved or anything like that. But um, yeah, so I was competing for five years and I'd always been an athletic person all my life. Um, I used to spend all my time when I was a kid outside climbing trees and doing things. I really hated gym class, even though I was very athletic, but I really didn't like being in a sport where people are yelling at you and pushing you and, all that, and people are blowing whistles and everything. So I didn't like that kind of a thing, but I was very athletic in the sense that I just like using my body that way. Um, and I, I really loved also, I, was, I did a lot of ballet and other forms of dance when I was a kid and even into as an adult, um, was still con you know continuing studying ballet for a while there. Uh, and gymnastics as well. So just really love movement and using, you know, understanding my body and having that feeling of using the body and seeing what it could do. Uh, and at the time that I got into actual bodybuilding, I never heard of bodybuilding as a thing to tell you the truth. I just never thought about it. And my, uh, the man that I was married to at the time had bought a gym, a home gym set for himself. 
and he didn't really end up using it that much, but I just really took right to it. And I had had my, my young sons, they were really young at that time, like little babies. Um, and I had thought that it would be really nice to exercise at home, you know, and just feel that powerful feeling again. Uh, and part of the home gym set had a chin up bar. And I just, when I was a kid, I used to do chin ups all the time. In fact, when I was in second grade, I won a prize for doing the longest flex arm hang chin ups. And I got actually a prize from the presidential medal of physical fitness or something like that. That was um, some kind of thing they did at the time. But anyway, um, because I had sort of had that technique throughout my childhood, when this chin up bar showed up when I was 24 or something, um, I just kind of jumped up and started doing chin ups and I could do it right away. And my husband was like, what? Because <laughs> he didn't know I could do that. And so um, <laughs> it just, you know, was inspiring to me for him to think that was cool. And I wanted him to think I was cool. And so I just got more into working out and it just became a real, you know, form of pleasure for me to be working out and exercising and lifting weights. Um, and then at one point I joined a gym and that's even more inspiring. You know, you're learning things from other people. And um, so it was just, it was a great time. Uh, I learned a lot about what I was capable of and how much more I could do than I thought I could do. You know, there were a lot of times that I was like, no way, I could never do that. And I really just did it. And then it, it just gave me so much confidence. Uh, it was a great experience. Well, it's, it's just amazing. And I'm sure that also uh, tied into your awareness of how to draw and paint the human body because your, um, you know, your awareness of anatomy is just extraordinary. Well, it definitely helps. And, and uh, I had been doing life drawing before I ever got into bodybuilding. So that was also a real fascination for me because I, I knew about these muscles from doing my life drawing. And then when I was, you know, doing it with my own body that way and really experiencing my muscles in this different way, um, you know, yeah, definitely it, it really all came together. And, and also I have to say, um, being in the competitions, um, you know, you have to be on stage and you have to perform a routine and that kind of thing. And that went along with my dance background but it really helped me to understand a lot about like, and I, I understood a lot of this from my dance time too, but the visual lines that you create with your body and your, even the direction your eyes are looking and that kind of a thing. And I carry that into my paintings now. It's like a combination with bodybuilding and dance, you know, and, and it just, you know, you, you see these lines that you create that makes the symmetry and the dynamic poses so that they, you know, have a flow to them. Mm -hmm. Julie Bell, um, there's a question from the audience I think is good here. They asked, do you ever use yourself as a subject in your art? Oh, for sure. Yes, I do. Um, as, as Stephanie mentioned, I had modeled for Boris before I started making my own paintings. And, um, you know, it, it really, like the models that we've worked with that our artists themselves tend to understand more easily the direction that this poses should be. Um, most of the models actually, even if they don't make art, they don't realize that they actually are artists <laughs> at heart. Um, and so it's just like a feeling that they have for it. But definitely when you know exactly what you want, it really just makes it come out so much faster and easier to be able to do it yourself. Um, so I would have Boris photograph me if I wanted to do something that was of my own, you know, self in my own painting. And sometimes I photograph myself by setting a timer and then, you know, using the camera that way. Now with technology, it's really pretty easy to do that. So um, I'm learning more. I shouldn't say it's easy because it was hard for me at first. I was like, I would set the timer and then I would run and do the pose and then I would go back and it was just one picture at a time. And then I found out that you can make it so that it just keeps flashing. <laughs> so that was really good. Got really tired doing that the other way. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Sure. These yeah. are um, extraordinary. Are, are you your own model here on the left-hand side? Yeah, now this is a painting that Boris did of me um, that was for a tarot card set that we were doing at the time. We 
it's still kind of, it's a, an incomplete tarot set um, and hopefully someday it will be completed. I don't know. It's been put on the way back burner, unfortunately, but there's so many other exciting things that we're doing. Can't do everything, but um, yeah. And then uh, the one on the right is not me in the painting. It's, but it is a painting that we did together. But interestingly, the man in that painting is my son, Anthony. Um, he's the model for that, for that. But the, the woman in the painting was a woman who, actually the, the, the painting was commissioned by someone and this was his girlfriend or maybe just his friend, I don't know, but somebody who came with him to uh, pose for his painting. So that was that. Uh, Julie, someone from the audience asked, what was your favorite project that you've worked on with your husband? Oh, wow. Um, you, uh, favorite project that I've worked on with him. God, I couldn't possibly, <laughs> couldn't yeah. possibly answer that. Honest. I mean, I could <laughs> tell you a lot of things that I, I've just loved everything we've done together. Honestly, we, we've done so many things where, you know, some of that were collaborations that were um, for a lot of advertising work. Uh, where we needed to be really fast and it was just really exciting to do those things and somewhere we would each do individual paintings and then both contribute to a um, you know like our calendar I love our calendar every year where we we each do our own paintings and then we have some one or two collaborations within that body of those paintings um, Julie yeah. are you able to describe how how the collaboration works um, do you come up with ideas together? Do you each work on separate parts? How does that? You know, this it, I can definitely talk about it, but there's no description because there's no one way that it's done. You know, sometimes like, you know, let's just say it, it might be a, you know, a, a job that one person feels more like they just immediately see it. They understand this is what we have to do. And then, um, sketch out something and then it'll, it'll kind of get bounced back and forth that way. And then, uh, but sometimes, you know, we both have different ideas and we kind of like look at both of the things and then figure out, you know, which is best or maybe combine them or do something completely different, you know? Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why it would be different. Like sometimes time is a factor um, if there's, let's just say there's a job that is a collaborative, like somebody has commissioned us to be, to create a painting together, which happens a lot. They say, we want both of you to do this painting and both of you to sign it. And that's, by the way, that is how you know the ones that are collaborations are signed by both of us. And if they're not signed by both of us, then it's an individual painting. But, um, you know, if somebody comes with that and then maybe, you know, Boris is really busy or I'm really busy and I can't put that much into it at that moment, he'll do part of it to start and then I will jump in later or the other way around. But the thing that's really fortunate is that we both can do, we can play, each one of us can play all the parts. So it's very, um, it's great that we can, you know, I mean, we don't do it exactly the same as each other, but we like, I can do all the parts and he can do all the parts and so if somebody wants to do one side of it or can't do it or whatever, then it doesn't really matter. We can both do that. And sometimes we've done jobs where we would work in separate canvases and then put them together digitally into a collaborative piece of art. And that's typically more likely to happen for let's say an advertising job where the time is really you know, fast, they want their jobs really fast and they're very elaborate often. So it takes a lot of work and you have to really just get it all done. So you might have, sometimes we'll have like 10 different canvases that we'll paint all of them, you know, one at a time and then put them together. But since it's two of us and we can just, you know, bounce it all around and get it all done. That's great. Do you do, you do the digital adaptation yourselves? We do a lot of it. We're, neither one of us is really, really, really proficient as a digital artist. Um, seriously, I know my limitations and I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to do digital art that looks, eh, you know. <laughs> so, um, so if it's, you know, a part of the job that I can do that's going to just look great, like the one, in fact, that you showed a second ago that I modeled for with that was the tarot card. 
I actually did do some digital work on that one because the tarot card was the woman in the sunflower. And I think that mountain behind her. And then the whole right part of the page with the bird and the volcano came from different paintings. And I brought them in. We needed to have this painting fest. And so I brought these pieces together and created a new piece of art out of them. <laughs> so, and I think it's a pretty decent digital seamless job, but I wouldn't go into trying to actually paint digitally, you know, where I would create something new digitally. Um, one thing that we do that's kind of interesting with digital art is a lot of the time we'll paint figures nude because that's just how we want to see the actual painting to be finished. The, the um, original will have the figure nude. And for our calendar, we need to have clothes on everybody. And so we will paint on a separate canvas with paint, not digitally, but we will paint, um, you know, bikinis and stuff like different things for their clothes. So we've got this whole like paper doll <laughs> canvas thing and um, and then bring it over and, and then digitally put it onto the figure um, so that she'll have clothes. So it wow. does, yeah. So interesting Julie. to hear about that process. Yeah, I agree. And that we actually do have a question from our in-person audience. If you want, you can ask it yourself or I can ask it. All right. Hi, um, I know you love uh, horses quite a bit, but I was wondering what some of your other favorite animals are. And I understand that you're going to be doing uh, artwork with um, animals in um, more in the future. And I'd like to know what kind of projects and things they are. I'm a retired elementary school teacher and I love animals myself. Oh, yes, I love animals. I really do love animals. Um, I feel like they, you know, they symbolize they symbolize so many parts of myself and um, I just can't seem to resist bringing them into my art. But I really do love wolves and I mean, I love dogs. I really love, I, the, I, okay, I'm just gonna say it. The only animals I'm not in love with are a lot of reptiles that I don't like. Not all reptiles, I like some reptiles, <laughs> but I'm just not into snakes. I mean, <laughs> I, um, I grew up in Southeast Texas and I know snakes are really cool. And I do like them in art, but in real life in Southeast Texas, the snakes were very scary to me. And so I did get a kind of a phobia of snakes, um, especially poisonous ones. But, um, but anyway, um, yeah, my wolves are very special to me. And I think it's just that I grew up, you know, with my dog and I love my dog. I, I had a cat also, and I love my cat. I just, I just have a, I think I'm more of a dog myself. You know, I'm not really sure, but I feel like I'm more of a dog or a wolf kind of person. Um, so I am actually right now making a children's book. We'll show you pictures later on uh, that has a lot of animals in it. And they're, um, you know, they, they kind of represent a lot of our feelings and things like that. And it has a wild dog is the an African wild dog is the main character in the story. So I don't know how much you know about them, but they are really cool <laughs> animals. <laughs> Very cool. What's your favorite fact about those animals? About the wild dogs? Yeah. Oh, um, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I have always have a hard time picking favorite anything. I, <laughs> <laughs> I really do. People always say, what's your favorite something? And I'm like, it just makes my brain go like, ah. <laughs> They sure are, like, they're just the way they look. They, they look so smart. And, you know, uh, they're, they're as cute as any dog, but at the same time, they look like, you know, this is not a dog, you know, and it's not even like a wolf, but it's, they're just, they are super wild looking, um, but they really just look so smart. I think I just love, when I see an animal that looks extremely intelligent, it really makes me like, ah, I love that. It's such a beautiful piece, um, the light um, really revealing all the aspects of the fur, uh, just so beautifully done. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I really, I really fell in love with these wolves. Um, 
if you show, there's a picture in there that's a book cover I did of a girl with a wolf. Do you see that in the slides? Um, is Rich? Yeah, he oh, just said, uh, give me a sec. Okay. Is it there? I hope it's there. Maybe I left it out. Um, I don't think we have it, he says. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, okay. Um, I was doing a lot of book covers for Tor Books and um, they had me do a series of story of covers for them that involved wolves. And it was, a, it was one wolf and a girl and it was like her magic wolf kind of thing. And so anyway, the first cover I did for them, I used a wolf from a book, a picture in a book and I, I, I based my wolf on that. And then that cover was really successful and they, wanted me to just take the whole series and, and do more. So actually Boris suggested that we go and take some pictures of real wolves. Um, and I, oh, excuse me, hold on a second. I found uh, a place <laughs> just about an hour from here that was a, a wolf sanctuary, uh, Lakota Wolf Sanctuary. And, um, oh gosh, now I'm starting to, <laughs> Hold on a second. Sorry. You're fine. Uh, and so anyway, um, when I, we went there, I just took a lot of pictures of them, but they started doing this thing that you see in this photo and I'd never seen this kind of thing before, but um, they all just started growling and all their hair was up on the back of their neck and everything. And like they looked crazy and wild before, but when they started doing this, it was like really amazing because they started all just kind of swirling together and getting like, they weren't acting like dogs. They were doing this other thing that was much, much wilder. And uh, they would, they were really just showing like some kind of dominance display, but it was at the same time, very social. Like it wasn't like, angry or fighting it was some kind of thing it was a bond it was really more like bonding but it was definitely about where you are in the pack and you know they were all making their positions clear and I just at that when that happened it really was something that took maybe one minute from beginning to end I don't even know if it was that long but it just was like it blew my mind and it really just made me want to know everything about these wolves and what they were doing. And so I got a lot more into it at that point. And I, and I, uh, that's when I started doing this. I did that painting that you just saw because I just felt like I just want to do something where I can just spend all my time looking at these wolves and thinking about them and really honoring this wild thing that they do. Um, just it was very exciting for me. So yeah, and this one that you're looking at with these horses, kind of a similar thing. Now horses are prey animals and they have a whole different kind of society from the wolves, which are predator animals. And um, so, you know, they are, these two horses are having their conversation in their own way. And I just, I, don't, I just love seeing animals dealing with each other and having their connections with each other and, um, the way that they all communicate and have their societies and their, you know, their families. I just, it's just something that, I don't know. I just feel like it makes us all the same. It makes us all the same part of, you know, this world. And, you know, the humans are another kind of animal. We're all, we're all in it together. <laughs> so it just, it's just such a deep feeling of understanding of all of us, you know. Julie, I know we have a lot of, um, slides on animals, but we do have another question from the online audience. If you want, you can ask it yourself if you like, or I can read it either way. All right. So the question is, what advice do you have for a young person who aspires to be a professional illustrator and how do you make it? And I know we're, we talk about that later as well. So you can decide how, how much you want to elaborate on that now. Yeah, well, I, I mean, first I do have to say I'm 62 years old and I started doing this when I was 30. So that was, if you are a mathematician like I'm not, <laughs> 32 years ago. <laughs> um, 
and it was very different then. We didn't have the internet and we didn't have video games. We didn't have so many things back then that are existing now. It was more about publishing and publishing with paper, you know, and going to New York City and meeting people and that kind of thing. And I, I still think that's that's important, but I think that the the uh, scene has changed so much now. And I really think you have more opportunities now in so many ways. Um, I do have the opportunity myself to spend a lot of time being friends and you know talking to other illustrators who are younger than I am and seeing what they do. Um, and first of all, there's just no no uh, you know fast road in. It's like something that just to develop your skills, you got to expect that this is going to take you as long or longer than it would take you to become a surgeon or something seriously because. It's a good like 10 or 15 years really of putting in hard work before you really, I mean, not that you can't start getting work before that, but you, your skills change so, so much, you know, if you look back that much time, um, it really takes a very long time. And, and a lot of artists that start out, they expect they're just going to go to school for a year and they're going to be done. They're going to be ready to just jump out into the world, but they're going to be competing with people who have been doing it for decades so they have to realize that um that when they're starting out they're gonna have to um find the jobs whatever jobs they can really because you know it's it's a it's a field with a lot of work going on um but also it is a competitive field um i do think that with the game art that's out now and there's so many video games and so many things that are being done independently as well that there are a lot more opportunities for young artists than there used to be. And there are definitely going to be some where you're going to feel that you're working a lot more than you should for the amount of money you're getting to begin with. And I don't think that's necessarily great, but at the same time, if you're getting, if you're doing this work, you're, you're basically getting on the job training your, you're kind of like still continuing your school by having that job. Um, so I would say at least to begin with, take some of those jobs and let that be part of your schooling is just having that job, you know, doing these early jobs that really don't pay much, but they, they forced you to be in that pool of the other artists. Um, so, uh, you know, that's one of those things that a lot of young people do struggle with is, you know, like, taking jobs like that. And I, I, I don't know, it's not a great, a great thing to be in that position, but at the same time, if you can consider it to be part of your school and you can afford to do it, it's a good training for you. Um, and being an illustrator is a great training as an artist at all, anyway, because you have to have skills to bring these images to life um, in a way that, that's gonna you know, pass the test. And uh, it, since it's going to be for publication or for a commission, it's very different than just doing your own personal art that you're going to put in a gallery and hope somebody buys it. Because with that, you can do whatever you want. And when it's illustration, you're basically fulfilling someone else's, um, you know, specifications. And it really is kind of like, you know, really hard training, but it does give you skills that you can't just get just by doing whatever you feel like. I really think kind of forces you to work harder. Thank you, Julie. That's a great answer. I know you mentioned game art. Uh, maybe this would be a good time to transition to talk about some of the work for games that you've done. Yeah. Um, the one that you showed before with the guy with the sword and the skeleton. I don't know if you can see that, Rich. There's, that's the first, this is the first video game art that I did. Um, I think his name was Axe Battler. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, it's not an Axe Battler. It couldn't be because he didn't have an axe. So I don't know what it is called. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> anyway, it's something about Savage Land or something like that. But anyway, this was my very first video game cover that I ever got. And I was super excited to have this job offered to me. Um, because I really, my sons loved video games. They were kids and they were really into that. And they were really excited that mom was doing a video game cover and, you know, uh, it just felt so great to have this job. So we actually bought a skeleton that we used 
and we still have today hanging in our basement. <laughs> and um, well, her name is Miss Chicken Good. I don't know where that name came from. I can't remember. But anyway, that's the skeleton that you see there is Miss Chicken Good. And uh, so, yeah. And then these are some other paintings I did with the actual covers on them. So you can see which ones they are. And I was just very proud of getting this work for video game covers. And it's really cool because now uh, one of my sons does video game art for the, for the games themselves digitally. And that's exciting that, so um, yeah, just, you know, it was just, a, it was another job. I mean, I didn't do anything really different with these um you know to create them or anything i but it was kind of interesting because uh at the time some of them like especially i think with super Valis, i can't remember which ones they were but there were some of them that came in like the rep they would send you pictures of what they wanted and it was just like these little like 10 pixel <laughs> blobs you know and they'd say like this is a robot and this is a monster you know, things like that. And um, so you get, to, you got to be very creative with what these things looked like. You got to make up what was actually, what these characters looked like, which I thought was really fun. And I guess, I mean, now the games are so elaborate and beautifully done, you know, that they're there already. So if you were gonna paint a cover like this, which I don't think they make the covers necessarily painted anymore, but, um, if you were going to, you would have to make it look like those characters that are there. Uh, but at that time, it was fun to be able to make it up. I liked that. Julie, did you always draw? And I wonder if you could just say a little bit about your own training. I did always draw. Yeah, I really always loved to draw. And all my life, since I was really little, I remember loving to draw, having notebooks of drawings and you know, wanting to mess with paint. Um, I remember, I can remember to this day, a time when I was in preschool and they gave us finger paint and I had this blue on my hands and I just was in love with the marks that it made on the page. You know, I wasn't even looking at making anything out of it. It just like the swirls and the fingerprints and just the way that it reacted with the paper I just remember just looking at that forever and just running my hands through that paint. It was just a wonderful feeling. In fact, when I finished, everybody was gone out of the room. <laughs> I don't know where they went. They all went to do something else. <laughs> I was there like, ugh. <laughs> um, uh, Julie, I think this is a good time to ask on this slide in contrast to the last slide. Uh, someone asked, do you paint women differently than male artists? And are you conscious of depicting them in different ways than a male artist might? I am positive that that's the case. I don't see how it couldn't be that way. I, I definitely think that, um, you know, Boris and I definitely approach, we're, we're, you know, we're definitely different. I mean, he has a more masculine approach to whatever he draws and paints and I have a more feminine approach. And it is so interesting how it comes out. It's such a good question. And it's really good to analyze these things with your own art as well, um, because, you know, it's like uh, when I was trying to, in fact, do work, I was trying to paint dragons at one point, and I really always loved the dragons that Boris would paint. And the thing about them is they were so manly and, and really very macho and beastly and everything. And I wanted my dragons to have this kind of quality, but it kept, it kept coming out like, feminine looking and I just couldn't understand. And whenever I would try to make it look masculine, it just looked ridiculous. You know, they just didn't have that kind of punch to them. And so until the point when Boris, you know, I was, I would be so upset. I would be like crying because my dragon just didn't have it, <laughs> you know? And he, and he was like, you know, just make your own dragons. Don't try to make my dragons. You have, you, your dragons, you have your own dragon and just do that. And so it really was a kind of a turning point for me in my mind. It opened my mind to the idea that, you know, when I was younger, I did used to make dragons that were mine and I didn't compare them to anybody else's. I just did my own thing. And I, I'm just going to go back to in my mind when I was younger, like, you know, 10 years old and think about how I thought about dragons and I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to develop it 
the way I would now with my skills that I have. And it was an amazing feeling. And it really, it opened a door in my mind about, you know, don't try to make my stuff be more Boris or more masculine or more anything other than what I am. And it, and it really, um, it really gave me something great to hold on to then. I, I felt like I have it in me now. And it was a very empowering moment. Thank you. That's a very good uh, message. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder if we could just ask a little bit about um, the Conan the Barbarian on the last slide, because uh, as I understand it, you were actually the first female artist to portray Conan yeah. on, a, on a cover. Um, yeah. I wonder, what was that like to get that assignment? And can you say a little bit about it? It was really, it was an amazing thing too. Uh, now, this is not the first Conan I did. The first one I did was this one where he's fighting with this um, metal horse. But um, yeah, I, the thing that it was just funny because the whole thing with Marvel, I was, I was drawn to go there because somebody, I won't name them in my past had told me I couldn't do it. <laughs> and it's like, when somebody tells me I can't do something, that's my rocket fuel, you know, as long as it's safe and it's legal, <laughs> then I want to do, if I feel like I want to do this thing and if somebody tells me I can't do it, it really does push me to make me prove that person wrong. And so I thought I'm going to go to Marvel Comics and I'm going to show them that this is after I had been doing video games and I had done video game covers and I had done also my things for heavy metal. So I had something to show them. And um, so I did, and John Romita Sr. was a person that I met there and he was so nice. And he really just took me in and he, he took me into his office and he was like, I think you should do Conan. And so he gave me that first job doing Conan cover. And then I did a couple more for them. Um, and, and then I did some other, like, then I really got into the superheroes after that, because <laughs> they really liked the way I did those paintings. So. Thank you for that story. Yeah, I never got to hear how that person reacted, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you did it, that's for sure. I did. <laughs> so, so yeah. What are, and, at? What, are, what are we looking at here? Um, tell us a little bit about these. Yeah, so this Iron Man on the right is the one, the first one of the superheroes that I did. Uh, and then because they saw the Conan covers and they really liked the way I did the metal and they had decided they were going to start doing trading cards. Um, so they thought it would be cool to have, uh, and you know, have me do some of the trading card characters, trading cards with the metal characters to begin with. And so they had me do Iron Man and Silver Surfer. And then they also had me do one of Psylocke, which isn't metal, but I think they liked the way I painted women. So um, then they liked those and it just kind of took off from there. And I did a whole bunch of stuff for Marvel after that. And um, I did a whole set of Marvel masterpieces for them, which Boris actually also came in and he had never really been doing superheroes. He had worked with, I don't know if he'd worked with Marvel. He had done other comic stuff that was like horror comics in his past, but he wasn't really involved with Marvel as comic art at that time or comic characters at that time, like superheroes. So anyway, that was fun because that was one of our first big joint projects where he did half the set and I did half of the set. And um, so, it was a lot. It was like a hundred and I don't know how many there were in the set. It was over a hundred altogether. So, uh, and it took, you know, a long time to do it and everything, but it was a great thing and I loved it. And this one of the, um, the ex women in the middle that you see there. See, that's the thing. I think that what they like is like, I like, I like power and strength in a woman. And, you know, I also think delicate and graceful and everything is really great too, but I just like, I think the feeling of empowerment in anybody is, uh, you know, a good a good thing. And I and I um, like I think that they they feel my sense of my own expression of that kind of empowerment in the way that I paint the women. And when you were asking about the difference between the way I paint women 
and other maybe other male artists, I'm thinking about that more than I'm thinking about them as someone to be attracted to. I'm thinking more about them as their own self, you know? And so um, it was just really fun to do this, this uh, particular painting here. Thank you, Julie. I just want to take a moment and check in with the in-person audience. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Looks like we have a question. Uh, just give me one second here. Sure. Uh, do you have like a studio? Yes, I do. Um, I mean, the studio that I paint in is here in our house. And uh, I share that studio with Boris. We each have half the room, <laughs> except my half is about three quarters of the room. <laughs> so, you know, my paintings are big. <laughs> but he's, he's very generous with his space. He doesn't mind. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, we share our studio and, um, you know, and we also have a photo studio that we use to shoot reference of models when we have models here. Um, and I also shoot at an outside studio. I shoot photos at, an out, at a studio away from here where they have more space because our photo studio isn't that big. Thank you. Sure. I think we're all set to move on if we have any other questions. Oh, we have another uh, in-person question. Just give me a sec here. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious to hear from Julie about what, what was your breakthrough moment as an artist where, you know, you had this dream, you had this talent. When was your moment where you're like, wow, I've really made it. I'm an artist. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. When, when did that moment come and what was it like for you personally? Well, I think... I think it was an ongoing thing because um, the first uh, thing I ever had that was, you know, published it out to the big world and everything was the first heavy metal cover that I did. And um, that was amazing for me because it was one of the first paintings I did where I really put a serious effort into it. Um, but it and so that was that was a really big deal for me. But it's interesting how, and I think a lot of people might have this experience when they are doing something like, you know, whatever it is that they're going to achieve is that after you achieve a thing like that, it's not like it's not a big deal, but you realize once you've gotten there that that's not, you're not like set for life now. You've got, it's just like, that's one thing you did. And now you have to do another thing and another thing. And so all the things that I've done along the way, um, have just added to that feeling of that. Um, you know, I remember hearing once that Elvis Presley used to always say to himself, even like for his whole life, he said, well, if this singing thing doesn't work, I'll just have to go back to driving trucks, I guess. I could always do that, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I think a lot of people, you know, they might just kind of feel like, you know, even though they see it working, there's no guarantee that anything's going to ever like you're not set for life or anything you just have to continue so there's never this feeling like I'm there and that's it and you know I mean I do feel a lot of confidence and um you know security that I've established a position that people like what I'm doing and that kind of thing but I just I don't know I think it's part of my nature that I allow I, I definitely don't, I'm not a, I am, I do have my own insecurities and I allow those insecurities to be part of my rocket fuel, you know, because I want that, I, it's kind of like keeping that eye of the tiger, you know, from like Rocky, you know, you've got to stay hungry and you've got to always feel like that you're, you're trying to achieve something if you want to keep growing and, and going forward. Thank you. Julie, these paintings are gorgeous. Um, were these done for your, um, your personal uh, yeah. work or the assignments? Yeah, this one here is is my um, is one that's for my personal children's book that I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. And this is our main character. His name is Wild Dog. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's going to be having his little story there. So yeah, the thing is that I had done a bunch of paintings just for myself that um, weren't really intended to be part of a story. But after I got a whole bunch of them, you know, I had done a whole bunch of them. And a friend of mine who's a writer, Sherry Ross is her name, 
um, she actually said to me, Julie, you know, you should take these and put them together. And they feel to me like they belong in the same world. And like these, you, I know there's a story in here with these pictures that you've done already. And so I had about like 12 or 15 at the time. I think it was maybe just 12. I'm not sure. But, um, you know, when she said that, I just thought, well, gosh, that is a cool idea. I love that idea. But I didn't have any idea of what the story would be. And then it was just really amazing that not too long after that, I actually got uh, an email from a publisher. It was an independent publisher that was just starting. And now they're actually doing really fine and, you know, making books and everything. And they wanted to know if I would be interested in making children's book, a children's book that I would write that would have art that was kind of really more psychedelic and, you know, not typical stuff that you see right now. And I was like, are you kidding me? This is just like, what? And so I, I was like, I got to write that story now, you know? And so I got really excited and I, so I just put all the pictures out in front of me and I left them for like weeks and I just looked at them all together. You know, like every day I would see all these pictures together. And then when I would be out going, like I walk my dogs every day. And so I'd be out walking and I would just be thinking about my story. And it just, all of a sudden it just all came together. And I realized this is the story and it's so great. It's about the wild dog. And so then I just, after I had the story understood in my mind and in my heart, then I started making new pieces of art that would, you know, tie it together. There were places where it needed to have things that tie it together. Um, so I'm pretty close to finishing everything now. And so it's really exciting. That's exciting. Is that the first uh, book that you've actually written yourself? It is. Yeah. Now I did, <clears throat> I did illustrate the book uh, for Sherry Ross, The Return of the Vine Tropes. Um, that she wrote, she's the one I was just mentioning before. And uh, that was a lot of fun to illustrate her story. And it wasn't an illustrated storybook, like mine's a storybook where there's like a picture on each page. Hers was more of like a children's novel. And it had, I think we had 12 um, paintings in there. I can't remember exactly, but I think it was about 12 paintings, but it's a really cool story that she wrote, but it's like a whole novel. And it's just like a whole world that she's created there. So, um, yeah, so she's Julie, been a really good friend to me. Sorry. Uh, demonstrate. Oops, the sound got messed up. I'm sorry, did you want to demonstrate some of the paintings that you had? I'm, I'm not hearing it. One second. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's good. Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, did you? I, I was just asking if you wanted to demonstrate some of the paintings that you had in person. Yeah, actually, um, it's kind of neat because so now here's another one that's from my storybook. That's one that I did have to create to fill in one of the gaps. I don't know how well you can see this. We can see it. it. It's one of the characters, and this painting is in progress. It's not finished yet, but it's an egret that. Um, helps Wild Doug in his adventure. That looks amazing. And, oh, thank you. It's it's fun to work this way where, you know, if it's for my own storybook, it really it really is so exciting to be making this art. Um, I'm actually part of, I can't show you this right now because it's too big, but I'm making the cover for it and I'm going to be painting it at four foot by five foot just because I want to make this giant painting. <laughs> It'll be really fun. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is a painting that's even less finished than the one that you just saw. And this is uh, crazy. <laughs> this is a wild dog and he's really, really happy right now. <laughs> so. Wonderful. But this is how I start a lot of the paintings is that I just kind of like throw it down there. Just like if you were going to make pottery or something, you just sort of start with your lump and you throw it down and shape it and then bring it together. Um, and I think that when I start a painting that way, where I just kind of let it out just to begin with, um, it really, to me, it has a lot of emotion when I do that. So I like that. And then uh, bring in more discipline to it as it goes along, make it more finished. Thank I you. Yeah, I have some other paintings, but they're they're not from my storybook or anything. So, yeah. That's very interesting to see how they look so beautiful when they're just halfway done, just in oh, a different way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 
this is a painting um, I did of my daughter-in-law, Dina, who is a very beautiful person. And um, I just really wanted to do a painting of her. I, I love the idea of portrait. I've always loved portraits. Even when I was like in high school, I would do portraits of people in the school. And I remember some of my teachers having me do portraits of other teachers for presents for them and things like that. Um, but this one, I thought it would be, I, I just started getting into this idea of doing something with flamingos also. And so I thought, you know, it'd be so great to bring it together and do the portrait with the flamingos. Um, so yeah, I just wanted this really peaceful feeling. I wanted you to feel like you're there and you can feel the fabric and you can feel the softness of everything. And just like, even though, you know, you wouldn't really just sit around with flamingos like that, um, for different reasons, obviously, <laughs> it might be kind of, I don't know, but anyway, uh, I, I think it just looks like a very peaceful and clean environment to me. It feels good to look at that. Julie, someone from our online audience asked, can you discuss your preference for hyper-realism? Yeah, um, I do. I really like, I love detail. I enjoy very much. I think there's a certain part of my brain that just gets a physical pleasure from painting details. And that's one thing when I'm painting the wolves or anything, I'm painting a person's face or their skin. I enjoy that feeling of really making that detail happen. And so I actually have to watch myself that I don't, you know, overdo that. Cause I feel for myself in my own style of working, I don't want the painting to look like an actual photograph. I want it to have a pho some photographic sense to it that it, it's very realistic, but um, but I don't want you to look at it and literally think it's a photograph um, because to me, it's like the photograph would already be beautiful. And so the painting needs to be more than a photograph for me. So that's one reason I started bringing, like bringing more of the fantastic kind of elements into the painting with the more photographic looking rendering of the figures um, you know, to Thank just, you. yeah, mm -hmm. I think it makes it a little bit more alive in a way for me because, um, because then it's like, you feel like you're, it's like more breathing or something. Julie, do you do preliminary drawings or are you working directly on your canvases? This is just amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I do. Sometimes I, it depends, you know, it's different, different ways. Like sometimes I start like the way I did with this one with the dog where I just jump right into paint. Um, and I do, I do that when I paint also figures from life. When I paint people from life, um, I will just go right into paint. I don't want to draw it first. This particular one, I used a photograph to work from. These girls were <laughs> playing in their yard um, in my neighborhood several years before I painted it. I actually just took this picture with my phone. I took a picture of, or I took several pictures of them with my phone and I just had them in my phone for a long time. And every time I would come across that picture, I was just struck by how much I loved seeing them in the tree. And I think it had to do with me climbing trees when I was younger and, you know, playing the same, they were playing some kind of imagination game and they, I called themselves nature girls. And that was their, like their team was the nature girls. And I just, I did that exact same kind of stuff. I'm sure many of you did, hopefully all of you, because awesome thing to do. We should all be doing it every day now. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, living, going into your imaginary world is just such a great thing. And I just really wanted to get the feeling of that in this. And I also really loved how these girls, and I know them personally too. I know their moms and their families and, these girls have really been encouraged to be exactly who they are, which to me is really important that people be encouraged to do that. And I, I like it, like you can see that in them that they are allowed to be themselves and just do their thing. And um, I just wanted to get that feeling. To me, that's just really powerful. You know, they're little kids, but they're, they have power because they know who they are. And these kids are loved and have this power of 
that kind of security in themselves. I just love that. Definitely comes through. Thank you. This painting um, I did really just because I wanted to. This model is a woman named Jenna that is one of my favorite models that I've worked with because she she's just done so much work with me. Um, and she's she's just got a really, she's very expressive with the way she moves. And um, so it's funny because the first day that she came to model for me, I only was able to get a very few, just the smallest handful of pictures of her for some reason. I don't remember what happened. Something happened with the, uh, the pictures that I shot. Something happened to the, you know, the images that got messed up. And so I only had this little handful of them, but almost all of the images were just so great. And it, she just really inspired me. So I thought I just, these, both of the women in this painting are her. Um, but I, I just thought, I just wanted to just do this painting because I just love these pictures of her so much. And um, so I, I thought that it was neat to think of like, um, let's see, how was it? It was like past, present and future. And like the, um, the woman who's looking out, of course, is looking into the future. And the one who's looking down is looking into the past. And then this dragon that they're riding on is the present. And it's just moving through the present. So it was just this kind of feeling of something symbolic going on, you know, but um, also with a real classic feeling to it, but also not classic because all this the way it's so designy and all that, uh, you know, very loose in the background and with that dragon. You know, I, I wanted that to be more modern and more just kind of abstract, spontaneous. Julie, when you started out in the field of fantasy illustration, were there very many women painters? Uh, and do you find that many more women are entering the field now? I don't know how many there were at the time. I don't think there were nearly as many as there are now. I'll say that for sure. Um, there, there weren't as many for sure. Uh, now there definitely are. I, I feel like the young women that are right now are really so much more confident and forward thinking and powerful in themselves um, than we were when I was younger. And um, it's just great. I love that. And yeah, definitely, you know, the women like in, like in the game industry and you know, um, illustration for publishing and that kind of thing. I see a lot of a lot of women art directors that are very powerful people that are friends of mine. Um, and uh, so I just think it's, you know, it's become more about like, you know, your skills in that. And it's and I mean, I think it was that to begin with. But I think, um, you know, women, women are just more out there with it and more confident. And I think also just, you know, there's more uh, people, I feel like maybe it's just me in the world that I'm in, but I feel like that people are seeing this kind of art as something they can have a career in. It has more of a reality to it. I remember when I was um, like in high school or college studying art, I only knew artists as art teachers. I really didn't know anybody who ever did illustration as their living or you know had a job doing art as a living at all not one single person um i had one art teacher that sold his art in galleries and that was the closest it came to that and that really wasn't you know necessarily what i was thinking of doing i really wanted to do illustration um and until i met boris i really that was he was the first person i ever met that was an actual artist for his career and made a living that way and so at that time when I when I did meet him it made me it just brought the whole thing as a reality to me and now it wasn't such a mysterious world and I think that because now you have the internet and people are having discussions online and um, you know there's just so much more information for people to have that they can see they 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 see this as like a world you can be in it's just a Thing that you can do you just have to do the work and meet the people and that's basically the formula <laughs> you know do the work meet the people keep doing it more and more <laughs> so this painting that you're that we're looking at here is uh, it was a private 
um, comm privately commissioned portrait of the couple that you see here. And they came and modeled for me. And um, it was actually her concept to do a mermaid with um, the dolphins. And, and well, she was thinking dolphins, she was thinking more like just underwater creatures. And I kind of thought, uh, I kind of like the idea of just dolphins, um, but uh, I do like the idea of if it, we had some octopus in there or something too. But <laughs> I'll get to that next time. <laughs> but um, yeah, she loves mermaids. And so she wanted to be a mermaid and don't we all love mermaids? I love mermaids too. I spent so much of my childhood in the water outside and just imagining being a mermaid so I think, you know, it's fun to it's fun to do these commissions, these private commissions for people, the portraits that you feel like you really are kind of making someone's dream come true. And I just love that. I really enjoy that a lot. That's got to be fulfilling for sure. It is. Yeah. 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 And now this painting is, again, my, this model I mentioned before. And uh she has such a rock and roll spirit to her. And I just felt like I want to do a painting that's like when I was a kid in the seventies and, you know, this, I don't know. I keep thinking of the song Layla by Eric Clapton. When I see this, <laughs> you know, that part, that's the slow part in the, in the music. And it's like, and then it just blasts in and everything. But I just feel like this painting feels like rock and roll as a painting to me. So that's what I was thinking. And this painting, I just had this vision actually one day of a cloud of black leopards and thought, wow, I got to do that. I have to think of it like it's, this painting is called A Cloud of Black Leopards. And so it's like she's floating in on this cloud of black leopards. And I really enjoy creating these kind of backgrounds that you're seeing here where it looks realistic, but it's like, what are those things? How is that? That's it. I don't know. To me, it feels like realistic, but not, you know? And it, and I just really like that where you can't define why does it feel realistic when it doesn't look anything realistic, you know? And part of it does, but I don't know. And then here we have the one that's hanging in the Norman Rockwell Museum. Um, this was one that I painted really just... I started this painting just because I wanted to do a really large fantasy painting that this painting's four foot by five foot. And I really wanted to do it like if um, it was gonna be hanging in a museum or something and it was fantasy, you know, like people kind of, you know, like for the last, I think you've mentioned it in your, in uh, some of the things about your show, how in the last few decades, the world of fantasy art has kind of been looked upon as a little bit less than, you know, real art or something. And I feel like, you know, why? Look at what, you know, the Renaissance painters were doing and that kind of thing. And it's like, there was so much fantasy art. It's like a lot of it's religious, but there's like just all, it's all this flying people and, you know, all kinds of fantastic things going on and I thought I want to bring Pegasus here and get some mythology here and do something that just you know has this stylized dragon you know it's not like a regular dragon that you see it's my dragon I want to do it on a grand scale so that it really becomes something bigger and and give it like real respect as something that's real art so I thought if you want to see it that way you got to make it that's all there is so you can't Julie, wish um, for it. Sorry to interrupt. We have a question from the in-person audience, if you don't mind. Sure. Give me a second here. Thank you. And congratulations, Julie, on an amazing career and a wonderful, beautiful family of talent that you have. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, I, I was studying Pegasus in person. It's something here, and it's just amazing in person. And I finally got to see it. And I was doing a color study, trying to figure out your composition and how you mm -hmm. lay out. How you, how you think about and design what you're going to do. And I was just completely overwhelmed. <laughs> I was able to get as far as like the line, like how the lines flow, like her knee, like her arm is flowing into the wing, is flowing into the dragon, it's flowing into the, 
into the scarf. And I could see that design. I think, I hope I could see that. But how do you ultimately think about laying out the design and how each element is going to be on the canvas? I just, I'm just dying to know. Thank you. You know, it's really, it's really a visceral thing. It's a feeling. It's an actual feeling that I have. And I just, it really goes back to my days of being involved with dance. And I, I literally feel like I'm like sweeping around on that. Like I, I will make, like I'll, I like to do this big movements and then take a picture with my phone. Now it's make it small. Now go in there as it's small and think of it as a more literal composition and like how do these things work together? And then just start bringing it together that way. It's something that, you know, I start large and then bring it small. And then once I get it so that I, if I can see it small and that composition still holds. Also, if you have it and you turn it on its side and you turn it upside down, it should still look good. You know, if it looks good from all different directions, then your composition is solid, I feel. So, um, Julie, but, that's yeah. what Rockwell said too, because he used to look at his compositions um, in a mirror, kind of back. Yeah. And if they were working that way, he knew they were pretty sound. Yeah, and and you know, it's it's so like we do this, like we you use your phone, you take a picture of it, and then you know you can like definitely turning it on its side or turning it upside down or backwards, like you're saying, reverse any of those things. It really definitely makes it where um, you can see if your composition is lacking somewhere or if it's just something's disturbing going on. Um, Tyler Jacobson and Anna Dittman, they also said that. So I hope everybody's, the young artists are getting that. That's a big yeah. one. Good, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Thank using you. your phone question. is great help. Awesome. Yeah, it is good. Um, just as our speaker, our uh, audience member just said, it really is a painting that just envelops you when you stand before it. And it's just attracted so much attention in the gallery. Oh, that really makes me happy. Thank you so much for saying that. And I, I'm just really, really glad that it's being shown there so that, you know, people are saying that it makes me feel great. It makes me feel like I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> so good. Incredible. Thank, Thank you. you. And this is a painting of my other daughter-in-law, um, Noni, and um, she's wearing a robe that her mother gave her that's just really pretty. And she's just, a, she's an artist herself and she's super sensitive, sweet person. Um, and I just really wanted to do a beautiful painting of her. And so I had her, you know, with the robe, so that with this texture and, um, you know, just, sitting in a light and kind of daydreaming. I just wanted a feeling of relaxation and daydreaming in this painting. I just really wanted to bring the viewer there so that you could feel what she's feeling when you look at this. Beautiful, truly Thank filled you. with emotion. Um, Julie, what is it like to know that your, uh, your sons are such accomplished artists and do you all talk about art all the time? We do talk about art, you know, all the time. Um, I mean, we talk about a lot of things, but we talk about art all the time too. And we definitely all really um, run things past each other. And, you know, like, well, I do that more with them. They, you know, I love to see what they're doing, but um, they, they want to do their own thing more. So, but I, I definitely like to get their opinion about what I'm doing on certain things. And, um, you know, it's just great. And, and all of our friends are artists. We all share friends together. And so it's, it's a lot of, it's a wonderful thing. I can't, it's like beyond my wildest dreams that I have this kind of life and that my sons do as well. It's really beyond my dreams. Wonderful. So, yeah. I think a good question for, you know, as we start to wind down and, um, uh, from our online audience as would you like to see more of your work and works of others being shown in fine art galleries? Um, yeah, I, I would. I, you know, I'm working with um, a gallery in New York right now, Ray's Gallery, and I really like working with them. And I um, used to have an idea that I wanted to be in a lot of different galleries, and now I've kind of gotten to where I'm not feeling like that same way anymore I, I'm not really sure but I really like working with Ray's gallery and but as far as like to see more I would like to see 
more galleries uh, for sure taking fantasy art more seriously um, because it is such a beautiful thing. And I, and there's such a high level of skill and there is a lot of it being done now that's just like insane, it's so good. And I think that it's really a shame that the, you know, there's certain parts of the art establishment that really have, um, you know, like that's just kind of how markets work. They kind of control like what's good and what's not. And I, I just don't think it's always based. I think a lot of times it's not based on what's really popular necessarily, or even what's good, but it's based on some other thing that they, it's like they're marketing. They're, they're the genius marketing people. <laughs> if they, you know, if those marketing people decided to put their marketing skills into fantasy art, it would be valued the same way as, you know, these other things that are much higher values. So it's just one of those things. I don't know how that world works of that really high finance and all that, because that's just not what I think about all day. <laughs> so I'm thinking about unicorns and <laughs> wolves and stuff. <laughs> so, that's but, a, uh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, for them, they're good at that. You know, that's what they do. So more power to them, but I mean, it would be really cool if, uh, and, and I do see more galleries looking more seriously at fantasy art and having it come into what they're doing. And especially because like now the movies and things that are being done, you know, Marvel and these other, all these fantasy movies and things that are being done and Game of Thrones and all that stuff that's making a lot of money. And I think that a lot of that comes down to money. What's making money? So they're seeing that this stuff is making money. And so that's kind of a lot of what drives it too. Plus, a lot of the people who were younger and grew up loving this kind of stuff are now older and in power and have the money to make, you know, decisions. So, <laughs> mm, sorry. Well, it has been such a pleasure and an honor to speak to you this evening and um, to have your work on view. So thank you for all the support you've given to the exhibition and um, just we'll look forward to seeing more as you continue to make these incredible masterpieces. Well, thank, thank you. you. And Stephanie, I got to say also, thank you for telling us about Aunt Agnes. Hey, Aunt Agnes. <laughs> <laughs> and Stephanie's Aunt Agnes. <laughs> uh, oh, she is going to faint. <laughs> Hugs for you, Aunt Agnes. <laughs> uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Well, please, uh, I know enjoying every word. Oh, that's yep. nice. Thank you for that. On top of that, I just want to also say thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you and hearing about your artwork. So. Thank you, Drew. Thank you so much. And you did, it was really nice. You guys made it so much fun. And, and also thanks to everybody who asked questions because it really is great to hear from you and know what you're interested in hearing about. I really love that. Great questions, everybody. And yes. we thank everyone for joining us. I, we have some uh, ending slides, but I also just want to say thank everyone, uh, all of you for being here. There's been about 550 people here across all our platforms. I want to thank you all for making this a great discussion. Thank you. Our next program will be with Gary Gianni on August 24th at 5.30 p.m. And we also have the Fall Symposium, Enchanted Mythology and Fairy Tales from October 22nd to the 23rd. Uh, we also have The Magic of Trees, Plain Air with Dan Howe on Saturday, August 21st from 1 to 4 p.m. And then we'll have the third annual Art of Brewing Festivals. That will be super fun. Dean McKeever will be there. He's a really cool guy on Saturday, August 21st. And then on Wednesday, August 25th, we'll have Raiders of the Lost Ark, which will also be very fun. And then we have our exhibit, Enchanted, a History of Fantasy Illustration, that will be on uh, view for through October 31st, as well as the Land of Enchantment. If you want to support this work, sorry. Last slide. If you want to support this work, feel free to become a member on uh, nrm.org support. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next time.